Welcome to another Value First Expert interview. Uh, today, I'm very uh, happy to announce that we have Paul Field here. And uh, well, he has lots of experience. He has uh, experience with uh, big banks in the city, uh, other things too we'll talk about. Um, and also doing uh, Value First uh, methods in those uh, in those places. Now, before we go there, right. uh, can you uh, take me back to when you were about ten years old, maybe okay. nine, maybe thirteen? Doesn't really matter, but around that age, you know, who who is uh, who is Paul? Uh, wh where did you live? Uh, so I live in, lived in London. I've always lived in London. Um, just family home, uh, parents, and my brother. Yeah, one brother? Yep, just yeah. one brother. Older, uh, younger? Oh, yes, he's younger. Yeah. So he's, um, yeah, he's always got on very well, uh, quite a nice family. Uh, and at that point, I guess I'd always been interested in sort of science, maths, those kind of topics. And uh, the age you're drawing me to is 11, because 11's a pivotal age for me. Yeah. Because it's when I bought my first computer. Ah, what computer was that? Which was a, a ZX81. And I, I've thought back to why. I've got no idea why this appealed to me. But I'd seen, I think, some advert and thought that's what I wanted mm. for my birthday. So my parents, who also had no idea what such a thing was, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think got me one where I had the money for it. And then that's it. That's what started my IT career. And so then I was what did you do with that computer then? Did you play games? No, no, no. It's, this is back in the day where you, know, you turned on a computer and there's a little light, little flashing <laughs> cursor and you're expected to type. Yeah, there's nothing else. It's just that. No. <laughs> it's like, it works. Yeah, and <laughs> ZX, ZX81 on the keyboard actually had the, um, the programming words, you know, the go-tos and prints and right. so on. So, and you came with a manual. It's like, well, this is how to write a program. Mm. So when you bought a computer, that it's kind of implied you were going to program it, right. which is great. So yeah, I, I wrote, uh, I did write games, um, little games. I wrote a little animation program. Uh, and ZX81 was it's all like black and white, really chunky pixels. Um, yeah, 16K was a lot of RAM. Yeah, very, uh, very fun. And any storage? Uh, well, the oh, what well external tape? Tape, yeah. Yeah, so, so beep, beep. yeah. So yeah. Th there's this great, yeah. You heard the sound of the loading the kind of yeah. yeah I'm not even sure it went that fast. <laughs> I had those the tape. Yeah, you had to oh, write and then you had to yeah. put it on the tape and then and then you could load it in again and it's like beep beep. Yeah. Beep, beep. If you actually wanted to play a game, it's a good few minutes wait. <laughs> before it loaded. Yeah. So you have to be committed to it. And, <laughs> and since that time, did you pretty much stay with, like growing up, did you stay with, with programming? Uh, yeah, so I've had did other interests around it, but that was always what I loved doing. Yeah. So, uh, so after that, there's a BBC Micro, was the, the upgrade, had, had color, had a few colors. Woo. Yeah. Um, and there I got more into doing uh, assembler and machine code. Mm. And that, because it was always like, well, how can you push the limits of what this can do? Mm. And I was quite into 3D graphics. So 3D graphics on a, that kind of limited machine. Um, people had done it, because there was a game called Elite, which everyone raved about, because you could fly through, the, through a massive universe, in the 3D spaceships, or wireframe, so just lines, mm. not filled in. So I kind of wanted to write that. Mm. So. And you had nothing, the chips didn't have multiply instructions on them, so you had to write your own multiply and assembler, and um, then you know, matrix multiplication, all done yourself through assembler, no graphics chips or anything to help you out. Um, you know, directly writing pixels onto the screen. And how, uh, really how cool. did you learn that? Was that also the manual from the machine, or was it uh, a course? No, um, that's a good question. A lot would be self taught. Um, I'm uh, sure there must have been a book on the assembler uh, I would have picked up. Um, 
I'm trying to remember from where the maths book. came from. Probably there were lo- lo- lots of places. Yeah. Lots of places. I mean, there was learning. There was no internet to search, right? So no. there was a book or a course. But, or <laughs> no, no, it wasn't courses. It wasn't right. courses. It was all books. Some books. Or magazines, or yeah. basically doing a lot of stuff myself. Right. And just, just trying. Trying now. Now, um, uh, did you have any other interests? Uh, music. Music, yeah. Yeah, but connected to the computer. Ah. So again, I got a this is box called a music. Was it 500, I think? Yeah. You plugged in, because BBC was great for lots of peripherals. So you could plug that in, and then there was a programming language for music. So I'd learned to write music by using this programming language. Uh. Uh, then there's a kind of keyboard you could plug in, so I got that, and then taught myself to play well enough that I could write some music. Nice. Uh, so that's been, that's been a bit of a theme, probably not as well developed as I might like. So you're still doing something in music today? Uh, n- not so much, but occasionally. What? Well, uh, the main thing I do is write stupid songs for my children. Ah, wonderful. They're just like off-the-cuff things in the moment. You want to sing one that? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to fit you into that. All right. So nice. Now, uh, when when did you... So, so well, uh, at that age, you know, the young age, uh, did you have somebody that had a strong influence on you? I can't really pick out a someone. Um, I think my, obviously my parents did, but not in any, I think just in the, probably the environment. Yeah. Um, I think there were quite some quite supportive teachers at school, but again, more from a I, I did things and that, so I ended up writing software for the chemistry department. Oh. But so I think there was a that they various people saw saw a something I was doing and then gave me some space to fill it. So it wasn't right, but that's that's and sometimes that's re- and that's just really the space. Is, yeah, because that crops up later in my yeah. career as well. That that space to uh, uh, something I really value giving other people. Mm-hmm. It's um, almost taking some constraint, t- just enough of the constraints away. So there's not, a, there's not so big a space that you can't, I have no idea what to do. But there's enough space that you can create and do your own thing and something magic can occur. And I, thi- I think a number of people who are doing, helping with that, but it's only in retrospect you realise. The way they did it, the way they helped you. Yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. En- encouraging. It was, yeah. uh, uh, I remember the, Actually, yeah, because the, the chemistry, head of chemistry was quite good. He gave me he, he gave me this book that was about a really small book that had the equations for um, the probability of where electrons are around the atoms, the, the different shells. Mm. I don't know why. And I think he kind of was some. I don't even know if he suggested visualizing them. And I basically just went home, coded it, and whatever it was next day or a couple of days later. He's got this program on the BBC Micro that just plots all the things, and he's like, "Whoa, this is so <laughs> cool!" And I'm like, well, "It's great because I, you know, I've done something that was really interesting to do, and he likes it." Yeah. Um, and I wrote software for our youth club as well. So again, probably the, the head of the youth. I think they all had a something they. It's not like they wanted, so they got it from me, but they they had a a need, and I happened to fill it, and so some really positive relationship came out of that. Right. Because that was that was a little bit older. That was maybe yeah. sixteen. And let's move on there. Yeah. So sixteen, seven, eight. At, at around, you know, you go to universities when you really make your choices, I guess. Yeah. Um, so what was your choice? What university study? Uh, well, it was easy. Direct science. Computer science. Yeah. So I, kno- yeah. I never had this. It was always clear from eleven that I would be doing computing. So right. I loved it. And and that's uh, was that your first classes, your first sort of official training that wasn't self-taught? Or uh, there was, there were some computer courses at school, but actually I did the A-level early right. because cause I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> good. And again, the teachers were supportive in, in that. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, 
Uh, let's jump a little bit. Okay. So, what do you do now? What's your, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, what, what, what line of business are you in now? Uh, we're still, still in IT. Um, what happened in, if I go, take go, a little go bit back it, in the past. Go for it, go for it. So, so um, I realized, so I followed this technical path for a long time. Yeah. And uh, there came a point when I started managing a team. And when I managed a team, I had a really strong sense of how do I look after these people. Mm. Uh, which seemed to be different from a lot of the uh, I manage people by giving them tasks. So for me, uh, you know, I just naturally did one-to-one um, -one meetings with everyone. I, and I was in the team, so it's a, it's a team with, we're all together, we're all trying to produce some software, um, but I'm also their line manager. So it's all them daily. I made a point of uh, regular one-to-ones about what they wanted and what their career paths were and how they were, were doing. And just this came naturally. It wasn't because some people were telling me to. It's because that's, that's something inside me was saying this is an important thing. Right. Uh, and I think that, that's where I sort of switched and started coming out of a more technical role into more of a how do I support people in their kind of in their personal growth but also in support of a, a team or a project or something in the business um, so oh, and also connected to that because uh, we would this was back in the te team was probably early 2000s sometime um, so we were doing extreme programming as mm -hmm. a as a technique, as a way of running the team, yeah. um, and no one else was, and it was in a large bank. Yeah. So we started, I started spreading the word, and kind of out of that emerged the community of practice. Because again, for me, I saw lots of people who were interested or, or trying, but in some way constrained. So it's like, how can I build an environment? How can I help them do better? So where I've ended up now is an extension of that. So so, so switched from my technical to being more about um, how how people operate together to get the, like the best results for for a business or for customers um, but at the same time. Very much as a people, how do we operate as people? Yeah, so I can say like as a job title I'd probably go under Agile Coach yeah. but usually it's here's a large program, some stuff's going wrong in it. Um, Lots of people talk about process, and usually I'm walking and saying, well, I can see tons of talent. The people are really good. Actually, probably usually, they actually know the right thing, but in some way constrained. And if you just look at, look at that talent, get the right people talking to each other, get the right people thinking that actually can do something or allowed to do something, uh, with, with the right pods in the right places, actually a lot of magic happens. Mm. Plus then there's a set of techniques, um, particularly around like, value so when you've got hundreds of people them all having a sense of the direction they're going in that's actually consistent with each other and actually is what the business wants that that's a big big deal um, yeah so let's go let's go there a little bit well. then so um, you've done uh, workshops uh, with us yes. on value and yes. and and you actually done quite a lot of implementation yep. in banks yep. uh, anything there you'd like to like what's your experience uh, quantifying values uh, it, it's in bank projects? Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Um, there's, I think it's probably t two big things I've learned from, from these kind of methods, or, or maybe improved. So I'll do the value bit first. Um, so, to, so to tie that's that large number of people, so actually mm -hmm. the first big program I had more of a coach role on, but as I moved. So it was uh, 100 people in the program doing development and so on. Mm. Uh, nine business lines that they were trying to do transformation on. It's quite a long time ago, but the basic problem was uh, businesses were publishing end of day pricing information, but the processes were very manual, sort of Excel sheets, and obviously they wanted more. The solution was more, effectively, more consistency and automation. Mm. Um, and every business line had their unique ways of doing things and you know, very complicated. Um, 
and so we had and we had a situation where d developers were coding but uh, they were just please tell us what to do and the business analysts were like we'd like the developers to help us with solutions but they keep telling us just tell us what to do so it's, it's, it's quite complicated right um, what we did we actually did a couple of things over the the thing about the quantification was even with like requirements documents that thick and that complexity of the problem right when we re when I dug into it it was three things right and that's it three so things. so so uh, as I if I understand you right so you had initially a set you know hundreds or even yeah, thousands big, big of pages right document. and if you were to print them out like that of, of requirements but then you look at well what are the few things yeah there can control everything. Yeah. Right. And for in your case, you you found there were yeah. three things. Yeah. Yeah. That's remember it. what some of them Absolutely. or one of them were. Yeah. No, I can yeah. tell you all three. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just these requirements. Remember, nine business lines. You've got all kinds of choices going on live about um, which, which business first and or which part of it or you know everyone having a big fight. All right. And how do you prioritize that? It's not actually, it wasn't actually the software even so much. Right. Although it was, it was the business change. Right. Was I, li I like to highlight one thing. You say, how do you prioritize that? Yeah. Right. Now, I um, repeatedly on these interviews, I guess, uh, I, I like to highlight that in the agile world, which is, you know, very dominant or at least very popular now, uh, with lots of different techniques, um, very little on prioritization I mean there's uh, yes this is high medium low Moscow there's a product owner that prioritize but h how do they actually prioritize this that's it exactly what, what technique I mean because isn't that one of the key things in product development and project management to prioritize yeah. and, and certainly at the time I was doing this that there's more around now but at the time I was doing this I, I w my feeling was w we to a degree solve the technical practices. Like if, if you were doing XP well, you got all the pair programming and so on, right. um, you could run a really good technical team and we've done that and we've done that multiple times. Right. And it worked really well when you had, you worked directly with a business person, maybe a small business unit, and they actually knew they had the vision. And so they were the product owner. Right. So actually, and people like Jeff Sutherland usually when they say well, who the product owner is they say you go and get a trader you actually get a business person right. so what what, and what was happening in those methods is you're assuming that the product owner kind of knew they, they had internally some way in which they knew the direction and they could guide it mm -hmm. when you go to a nine business line and that's just the business lines let alone all the other organizational stakeholders you know mm -hmm. various risk compliance uh, security people, very senior business, uh, that the people who wanted the transformation at the high level, all the individual business unit owners, all the people on the ground doing the work, it just incredibly complicated thing to understand. So the, the woman who was, well she didn't have that title, but effectively was the product owner, mm -hmm. what is she supposed to, exactly to your point, what is she supposed to do to try and understand that landscape mm -hmm. and manage those conversations? Right. So she could be that product owner role to the teams, and that was exactly the, the problem we we had, and that the quantification was wonderful for. Right. So, and as you ask, I can tell you the three things. Yes. So end of day pricing. What they cared about was. Oh, sorry, say it again. So it was all about in publication of end of day pricing information. Yep. Yes. So every day, each of the business units had to say what the price of various things were. Yeah. So the, the three things were the um, timeliness. So when yeah. did when did that data actually become available? Yeah. And that's on the scale because it was uh, way too late. <laughs> 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 and it yeah. needed to be a lot earlier. Yeah. Uh, we had numbers on it. Yeah. Uh, there was um, accuracy. Right. So once it had been published, how many um, inconsistencies, errors did we did we find afterwards? Mm -hmm and uh, effort. So how many person hours of effort was required to produce that? Right. And that, that's so the three things. Right, so if you improve timeliness, accuracy, and effort, yep. somebody would be, would be really happy. Yep. Right? Yep. 
And so what I understand then you put those three things up front mm -hmm. and say that's what we're all about. Yep. Uh, whatever we do, yep. we need to improve timeliness, accuracy and or effort. Yep. Yeah. And, and even because those three words, although we had be tighter definitions and we had some words on it, mm. it's the fact you could list the three words. So right. if you go into a, a, a debate about Pete and you see it's going off topic, it's, it's a prioritization here, which business? Right. Okay. okay, so which is going to get us the most timeliness, accuracy and effort? Right. And it's just like, I, I, for a large amount of my time, most of my job right. was just almost saying that. Right, just reminding As many meetings as possible <laughs> uh, until it became the habit. Right. Um, and what happened? Did you deliver any improvement on any of these? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the, um, the, I mean the key, well, for a start, the, the, there's the improvement in the how we were operating yes. to get that. Yes. So when I said you know, BAs uh, felt the developers didn't involve, become involved in solutions, suddenly we had a way of saying what the problem was to the developers. And actually, you could delegate down. So even if you're doing a screen or you're doing a data load at some low level, in what way is that affecting timeliness, accuracy, or effort? Right. Or perhaps b badly affecting it. Right. Because you can, as a developer, if you don't know the big context, you can make decisions that, that actually undermine those things. So the repetition with the right groups of people made the communication much better and the problem solving much better. Um, and yes, I mean, there were other fun and games to do with technical practices and so on to sort out but um, I think that pro program is still like going in a much later form and is considered the like poster child of agile for the, the bank from the right. guys I spoke to right. a little while ago. So yeah. That's good it, it, being the poster child yeah it, it did well yeah yeah that's fantastic um, all right now um, Okay, so uh, poster child of agile. What what is uh, good and what is bad, in your humble view, of how agile is taught, practiced, as you see it? Um, Do you have any views? Yeah, I on think that? the first thing that's bad is that, like, if I could get rid of anything, yeah, I'd actually get rid of the word. Right. Because I now have to start with. But you have it in your your. That's because title. That, that's what people will recruit or right. look for. Right. But you go. The first question is, if someone says, oh, well, "I'd like to be more agile," yeah. Or effectively, what what do you mean? Yeah. What would it's actually quantifying the um, benefits they want from agility because it, it it means for a long time it's meant so many things to so many different people and you immediately get into arguments about dogma. Right. And so for me, it was always about, um, actually because I came from XP, it was partly about holding yourself to a very high bar of excellence in what you do. Right. And so from the how, it's, it's that, and then actually experimentally trying things. Right. So on the how. So my teams would all be, always be running a kind of, what's the big experiment to improve how we work? Mm -hmm. So, good example, the team as XP practice of pair programming and the team had said, well, should we pair program on everything? We kind of don't know. Mm -hmm. So the experiment for a while was we pair programmed on everything for right. two weeks, I think, or maybe it's one week. Yeah. And then at the end, uh, funnily enough, everyone in the team had a really good idea of when it was a good idea to pair program and when it wasn't. Yeah. And um, I don't, for me, there was always meant to be that experimentation not just that's an example of in the how and also in the product itself mm -hmm. and it seems to have got lost in um, this is like the individuals and interactions over processes and tools so that kind of sense of, of who we are and how we operate and how we improve ourselves and how we talk to people was a, a, a it's part and holding ourselves to a high bar whereas most of what I see is um, have we got JIRA um, what's the format of a user story is that the user story is meant to be people going and talking to each other so we, we sort of somehow lost the heart of right. 
think that the people, the interactions, the, the technical excellence, the, but actually the professional excellence, because it's in, in product, in, uh, we, we seem to have lost design, mm -hmm. which is a, a shame. And the industry has gone mad for certification, when certification means going on a course for two days. Two days. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's qualifications I've got where you you had to work for years to get them or you had to do real work and the world expert inspected your work and gave you feedback on your work and expected you to apply that feedback and then you got the qualification that right. that seems worthwhile but everyone's a safe consultant or a certified scrum master and there's no way to tell um, you know what what's good. Skill so is, it's, it's, a bit, it's, it's a bit sad yeah. um, but there's loads of really good people who also uh, can understand this and make it work. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Now, um, so that was a fantastic success story. Mm -hmm. The the three values, uh, focusing on those. Now, uh, can you remember any big mistakes that you've done, or you've been part of, or but better if you've done them? You know, like we all. We all do mistakes. Oh, I, oh, I sure have my plenty. Uh, <laughs> you should have pre-warned uh, me so I could pick the most uh, <laughs> uh, the best one. Uh, Maybe in life too. Like there's there's work, there's life. I'm open. <laughs> uh, um, I'm trying to think what might be relevant for here. I mean, I'm always making mistakes. That's kind of the point of learning. Um, I think. So probably from the point of view, I suppose, of the value thing, I think, so I'm trying to think of mistakes that might be useful to, for other people to hear about. Yeah. So one of the things with, with some of the value stuff and quantification, I think it was trying to be too mature too early on a practice. Mm. So um, I, I'm going to generalise probably a couple of examples, but it would be pushing something about quantification a little bit too far and then you, you kind of get someone that people someone would disengage was actually if you leave it a, a bit better than right. it was then they'd be quite happy and then you could come back for another go a bit later on so that, right. that's one I, I so you had a, a you had a a maybe after a training with us or something you're all excited and you went like all out and then it was too much for for somebody and then it sort of backfired is that yeah I think ju just from a are being a bit disengaged, I think, uh, particularly around clarifying things, usually it's so woolly, mm. <laughs> so woolly, and, <laughs> and the skills I've got both from you and, and other things I've learned, I can get things to be so clear, <laughs> the, I know. And the, but the gap is enormous, I know. I, if you do, um, and mentally, so it's a, yeah, it's a, what I experience is like you have. Because people are used to this uh, woolly uh, specifications, so that's the norm. And then, like you say, we have tools and techniques to make it so sharp. Uh, but so it's it's not that difficult to do it. But you're gonna you you have to get people's minds, yeah. lots of people's minds, on the journey. Yeah, it's a journey. And, it's and that's the long distance. <laughs> it's true, and it's funny because the, the one I told you about, which is pretty much the first large program I did this on, um, I probably did it right. I didn't mucked it up afterwards with other things, in only small ways. Because it was that idea that it was three things. I actually had three simple words, right. and everyone actually had an intuitive view of what that meant. Right. So there was the quantification behind it, but probably 90% of the value was just in getting those three things repeated in lots of conversation, which is, it sounds so simple. Right. It almost sounds like, well, well, that's it, you just went around saying those three things and lots of meetings. Kind of, that was probably the most valuable thing, it was the repetition right. that got everyone aligned. Right. Um, I think if you overdo it, if you have 10 things and they're really quantified and you shove that up on a PowerPoint slide, right. it's not as effective as really getting people to work in way you know, get hands on with those three things and apply it into their work and kind of see how it goes, even if it's not, even if it's still a little bit fuzzy. Once they're doing that, 
then you can kind of ratchet up maybe actually measuring it or quantifying a bit more right. um, you, you know, detailed solutions so um, yeah that, that, that's a little pattern but that hopefully is a useful piece of advice for anyone who's, who's doing this right have you used uh, what I call value decision tables from those impact estimation tables yeah now that actually that was the second thing I that was really valuable before I met um, you and Tom we were doing so the thing I think got really lost from agile was design so and my teams my XP teams we always did a Okay, anything significant, we stop. You, and you, I always said you have to think of at least three options because right. two, two is a dilemma, three is a choice. And, and most people are one. Most people right? are one. one is like the requirement or whatever they call it, and it's actually the sign at the end and it's yeah. implemented. But you were saying, no, no, we have these three yep. symbolically, I'm not sure it's the same project, but you have a, a, a set of values. Now think of at least three options towards moving yeah. towards the uh, improvements yeah. there. So, so initially, it's, this was before meeting in the value thing, so just XP teams, but we always yeah. did technically, you've got to think of at least three options. Right. And what we generally found, so what, and what we started to do is go, well, fine, we've got three options. That's nice, because we stopped arguing with each other as well, because if you've got your option, I've got my option, we end up being about us right. and our egos. Yeah. If you think of a third one, and particularly if you put it somewhere else, put it on the table or on a whiteboard, right. it's not us anymore. We're discussing right. it. So that, that's powerful. But we always go, well, how, how do we decide? So we'd already started to get on the idea of you needed some kind of factors that were what was important about the solutions. Right. So we were, I felt we were, we'd got somewhere, and then I met Tom, and he showed me an impact estimation table. It's like, well, that's probably what we would have got to if we'd done this for another 10 years. Right. So I was already really bought into the idea. Yeah. Um, we. So so that that was great, and I think it, it's the. Well, I've already said some of it. It's partly you can take the idea from away from the person, so now it doesn't become about us. It comes about the ideas. Mm -hmm. We can take that how we're deciding again out of our instinctive guts into something. Again, we can put up on a wall a piece of paper and agree or disagree what it is. Right. And then we've got this way of of doing the decisions. And also, it's a delegation mechanism. So on the big program, mm -hmm. with the three things, we did it. So at the high level, we're deciding things like, uh, well, what kind of business might you do first? So bigger decisions. Right. But it delegates down to the development teams. We say, great, so we're doing this. And the three things are this. So think of, some, think of different options mm -hmm. and you know, decide which one's going to give you the most timeliness. And we ran into really funny pushback at one point by doing that one of the really early releases um, I remember lots of manual spreadsheets so one of the really early releases that went in of the software contained a new spreadsheet as part of it because they, they could do a certain amount of data load and they said well basically the quickest way to do is put it in a spreadsheet they'll do this bit of stuff they need to do and then it'll come back out so we could get an early release in that was fast fast to deliver and improved uh, I can't remember which of those factors um, probably probably um, effort and timeliness right so great and then there was this big kerfuffle because actually the how the business were judging the success was was the quantification of number of Excel sheets oh. so the fact that we'd introduced a new one okay rah, rah, rah. so again there's a big conversation about um, well, what you really cared about was the accuracy and the timeliness, and it does improve it. And of course, in the end, there won't be right. in more Excel spreadsheets. Just, in yeah. fact, this is a less risky spreadsheet than the one you had before. <laughs> um, but, um, but it's fascinating because the, the focus on what was important actually caused a, probably actually a good technical solution for an early delivery, um, but then caused a clash with some, you know, uh, views on what was important at a higher level so we right. could do some education but of course it's always quite explicit so you you can have these conversations and, yeah. and get somewhere so you, you talked now about early delivery so yeah. uh, earlier you talked about requirements back you know this thick uh, knowing banks uh, you know you, you have huge projects uh, lots of people yeah. long timelines yeah. uh, not a lot of deliveries like a one delivery maybe at the end kind of after enormous expenses 
but um, so I think that's uh, been the norm. Yeah. Uh, now, ha have you uh, also used, uh, you know, what maybe essential part of agile? It sounds like you have. I, I know you have. Yeah. Right? But um, <laughs> uh, of delivering some value early and and uh, what's the been experience of doing that in a bank, which is typically more yeah. rigid? Uh, I think there's a couple of scales. So the so if I go right right back in history to that those early XP teams. Yeah. So we so there it's because it's about the technical practices. So there we got the technical practices nailed. Right. So um, pretty much. So it wouldn't be continuous delivery back then. So continuous integration, you know, automatic deployments into environments, all yeah. this kind of thing. Um, so the, and the cadence we worked on was like a weekly cycle with our business to UAT in about a month for release, which back, this is many, I'd say early 2000s. Right. I, I know That's now great. everyone deploys every 10 seconds, right. but this is pretty good. Um, and what was fascinating about that, the, and we'd, we'd taken over a failing project on that, I think they had 30 people who hadn't delivered anything much for the business. And the way we operated was, we, we turned up and said, actually, what would you like next week? And they said, well, we, well, we want a website. And they haven't even delivered us a website. So said, we can get you a website by next week. It will say hello world on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're not in a value space exactly here. Right. But what we were in a, is a, we turned up, talked to the business about what was important to them. A week later, they got what we said. Right. Now, so in and, and just, just, I'm just only gonna, uh, let me just build to the value bit. No, no, Paul, I, oh want, I want to Sorry. stick there Hold just on. before you go to the value space. Um, because that what you just did now, most agile people see as being delivering value. Like I delivered a website, I yeah. deliver something. But uh, so just uh, you know, uh, yeah. So so when I talk to agile people, so yeah, you, you need to focus on delivering value, and they're like, well, we are focusing on delivering value. You know, we talk to the business and what they need, yeah. like a web page. And and they say that's valuable, and we deliver that. Yeah. So we deliver value. Yeah. That, well, that's not no, 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 what no. we're talking about no, no, here. No, no, no. Right. So now go ahead. Sorry. I need yeah, to no, just that, pinpoint that. No, it's fine. Uh, and I'll add something. So don't forget to say it later. Um, the other thing is, it's about software usually. So a number of times I've seen that. So that that example I gave you a minute ago, where some of the, the delivery had included some Excel. You think, well, I'm getting rid of the Excels, so I can't do that. It's got to be about this new shiny software. Right. No, they'd actually taken a step towards. It might not even be software. Right. It, it might be these business processes people are using. Can we just take a step out of it or um, make them a bit more consistent? Yes, something you could do in a week or two. If that creates value. If that creates value. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, th so this was early before. Mm -hmm. um, We've gone to quantification, but I think what, what was interesting about doing the fast loops mm -hmm. um, was at the start we got massive amounts of trust and from the business very quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you do that, it's deliver what you say you're going to do every week for about three or four weeks, mm -hmm. suddenly a very jaded business are like, who are these IT guys? You know, we've been through this hell last year. Mm -hmm. Are kind of going, well, actually, something <laughs> really is here. Yeah, then, then these guys are worth. Yeah, worth talking to. So then we actually started challenging them. Well, in a week, so w what's more important to you? Is it more important to have you know, a new kind of data or more important to have maybe a, a deeper view in this current one? Right. So we were still relying on them to have the internal prioritization, right. but we knew the aim was to be able to sell this to a tier one client as soon as possible. Right, so it's, it's, it's woolly before we'd done the value stuff. But we, we got to a point in really, I think, a few months where we were starting to say to them, are you taking this out yet? Because it's like, we're stopping you. Because it actually turned out they were a bit nervous about taking it to their tier one clients. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, so that's a, I, I just wanted to say that because it's not so tied to value, but it is tied to the, what's important about doing these fast loops. And a lot of it is the, it's the feedback, it's the learning. But it's the relationship actually right. between the different groups because we, we kind of it didn't feel like there was a separate business and IT in that right. group. And that, that happened on other projects like this as well. Right. On the larger program, uh, and actually, this is where I spend a lot of my time now is on, on 100 odd people 
finance things. I think there is much more of a shift these days to we want to go in faster loops and the, the kind of technology is more established um, for doing it. Uh, the problems are normally around like just coordinating that number of people and that number of teams to do it. So then the quantification and value stuff becomes essential because you've somehow got to let 10 teams know. Um, and the, the, the particular things I'm thinking about because the business problem spans the 10 teams. I know a lot of the time you can split into little teams who can kind of create value on their own, but a lot of this is like it's some really complicated end to end process that is very, very hard to create genuinely independent teams or, or certainly at the level of maturity where the banks are. So, but the real thing is if you can say, um, design you even take a what is a year long plan down to a step that's a month mm. is a big big deal and that can that can usually be done even on all the old crafty release stuff while you're working on the te technical practices right um, and, and then you kind of you work on the technical practices so you can get that shorter but the value thing is the thing that means you can coordinate the team so they actually um, join up on something useful um, but I think also on these big programs it's challenging whether it's even the software. That's that's a big that's such a big mind shift for people. <laughs> Saying could we just do something on the legacy system? Well no, no, no. But you know, it, in in two weeks you could make a actually quite a big dent in the things you care about by making some changes on the legacy system. Right. But what you're saying there is it really then helps having clear values, quantified values yeah, up front, and yeah. maybe also, uh, like you say, you know, you get many teams that are uh, delivering fast, how do you coordinate that? Well, yeah. you coordinate it towards the values, the yeah. common values yeah. that they're trying to achieve, it, right? Because it's, um, it's the alignment, it's the, it's that we, we were doing, we, last comment, we could do the, the demo, Yep. So we're doing everything Scrum. So I had sprint demos, but initially we had eight teams all doing their own demos to who knows who. Right. So we got them all to join up. And if they're to actually all join up and genuinely present, uh, and I know presenting isn't great, but if they could do that genuinely to a business person, because my teams always used to go into the room with the business people, watch the business people use the software, right. and then get the reaction, get the emotional reaction of, well, that's what I wanted, or ah, how's that work? Yeah. Right, and then we go away and process that. Right. So, trying to do that with that many teams, they've at least got to be able to, with some kind of single voice, say what they did over the last period of time. Right. For a senior set of senior stakeholders, to be able to hear that in a language they understand, mm. before you can even get to that that feedback piece. Yeah. And, and this, the quantification of values, is that's the like the Rosetta Stone of how a senior business person and a team can talk to each other. Right. Excellent. Now, um, uh, if, uh, if you were to give some advice to uh, younger people coming up, being interested in uh, programming, project management, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they all will hear about Agile, like the, 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 the popular at the time, whatever, that changes a little bit over time, but the, like the latest popular Agile mm. would be like salt to them, no matter what they do. Right? But what are they not sort of getting from there that they maybe want to study like, and go deeper into? Actually, um, if, I, if I'm going to advise, let me think, there's a, there's a couple of key pieces here. I think one is ho hold yourself to the highest bar of professional excellence you can at all times, even when it's really hard, even when you have to say difficult things. The next one is, for anything you read, track down the original source. Because there's so much, so many blogs that are just repeating what other people said, repeating what other people said. And when you, you actually go and find the original, um, you either find a source of great wisdom, um, or you'll find that it's not, nothing doesn't resemble what everyone else is saying, <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> Uh, but then you'll you'll get the thing. So be really good with the uh, yeah. source, going deeper, deeper, deeper into where did it come from. Yeah, yeah I, I also find this so much repetition. 
of somebody just say, oh, I'm an expert, and they just, because I read this thing, and then they just yep. put their little twist on it, and they publish yep. it, and, and they're good at maybe getting out to the people, so that's what you end up reading, uh, while the original source, maybe very few people see. Yeah. So, but usually there's a trade right? Yeah, there's, there's a trade you can get that. And I think the third thing, I've noticed yeah. the pattern of threes today. Yeah, threes good. Uh, it, it's find, like almost find your mentor. Like yeah. if you can find someone who is really doing it, doing the it, whatever your it is. Right. You know, project management, business analysis. Go, and actually the things outside your domain, because we're getting really specialized and like absolutely ha have Hold yourself to your professional bar of excellence, right. but ha have a basic competency in all the other skills around you as well. So you know, if you're a developer and you make that your profession, you get extremely good at it. Also know just a, just enough about how to be a business analyst, how to be a UX designer, how to be right. a project manager. And maybe and also uh, like how to do, in your case, for instance, banking. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Like the, the, not just the software programming, but the, the actual uh, yeah, the domain. The domain, domain yeah, knowledge. Who are, who are your think. users and customers? Go and find out. So you could actually, <laughs> could you, you know, do their job under supervision for a day? Like go and watch them or sit with them. And, and that's right. the bit I was coming to when I just oh. generalised was yeah. like almost find find your mentors or like go and find some people who do this and do it well. who have got a good reputation, and either talk to them or watch them or try and get on their projects or work alongside them or ask them to be your mentor. Right. Because they'll have all the things that. Um, you know, you basically, when someone writes down what it is they did, they usually leave out all the stuff that was really important, but they didn't realise was important because it's just what they do. Right. So you, you kind of need to go and find them and, and watch and talk to them yourself. Right. And that's really good. Don't take it second hand. If you do those things, um, it will be great. Excellent. Whatever you advice. do. Now, uh, another, like, do you have a, a book recommendation? Okay, I'm going I'm to go for one that just has nothing to do with IT. Yes. There's a, so my, because I ended up looking after people, I do a lot of things in the world of coaching, not, not agile coaching. So right. Like how we help people uh, develop themselves. Right. And that was, there's a great book called, I think it's, uh, I'll say it now, and if it's wrong, I'll tell you after. Yeah, so you yeah we can we can write it down in yeah. the called, um, comments. Words, I think it's words that change minds. Words that change minds. It's by um, Shelley Rose Charvet. Now, sounds a bit manipulative, but it's not. What what it's got is lots of behavioural patterns that people tend to default to. So you. So what's good is, because all of this is like, it's all about IT and processes and practices and techniques. This is the human thing. Go and read that book and just pick up a couple of things. An example one would be, uh, you might find someone is uh, going away from a problem or towards a goal. And in a context, someone might have a pattern of that. So the thing I see all the time in teams is a leader who is towards a goal. We want this great thing, we want this great thing and someone else who is away from the problems. They're saying, but if you do that, this bad thing will happen, this bad thing will happen. And the two of them can't talk, because they've got these opposite patterns. Right. Uh, the leader thinks the other one is uh, getting in the way, don't be so negative. Mm -hmm. The person seeing the problem is going, you're so naive. They're usually in a junior position, so they can't influence it. Uh, but of course, they can see all the risks that this visionary can't. When the two can actually talk to each other, you get a really good mix of direction. So we will go, if you only go away from a problem, you get rid of the problem, but who knows where you went, right? So you need someone with a vision so you actually go somewhere and someone who can see the problems so you don't fall down the potholes. And what the book's got is lots of patterns like that where you can mm. just sit here in how people talk, which they're doing, and so you suddenly understand why you can't talk to someone else because you're not and say patterns them right. and you can switch it. And, and it's, you, it's you switch your own patterns so you can... Be, you, yeah. You've got choices, you can either see it for other people and help facilitate them, right. you can notice your own pattern and say, so I've done this with a couple of people who needed to influence their leaders to go, instead of going, um, yes, but the problem is, go, in order to reach your goal, you need to do, 
and then put the you need to solve and put the problem in. You just like change a few words and say exactly what you wanted to say anyway. They suddenly go, oh yes, yeah, yes, of course we do. Excellent. We'll put it in the action plan, or whatever they need to do. So a few tweaks in your language suddenly mean you're communicating. So it's, it's a wonderful book for just getting into um, why you can't communicate with people Thank and do you. something about it. Now, um, communication to you. Uh, how, how would people get a hold of you? Is it okay I, I will share your email or...? Uh, yes, uh, so we can put this after some emails, uh, paul at clarityofpurpose.co.uk. Yeah. Um, I've got a website that's uh, clarityofpurpose.co.uk as well. We'll put that in there. Um, it's, fa it's fairly agile-ish. Paul Field, thank you very much. Good. Uh, fantastic. Pleasure. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And I hope uh, everybody got something great out of that. Um, I did, that's <laughs> for sure. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kai. Hey, that's great.